Hey, it's Illuminostic, and if you're watching this, that means you're a patron, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support. As promised, I am going to reveal to you in this video where you can find some of the most powerful secrets of Freemasonry, as well as some of the most succinct, clear expressions of the Gnosis that I have ever encountered anywhere. In fact, I think the book that we're going to discuss today is probably the most important and valuable mystical text ever written by anyone. Um, if you follow my videos, you're probably aware that I mention Aleister Crowley every once in a while, and this has gotten me into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> He's a very, very controversial figure. If you look at the conspiracy theory pages, you'll see that a lot of people consider him to be one of the evilest influences in human history, and I don't think that that is necessarily fair. Even if it is, his message was not to do as he did. Basically, Crowley was a magician, but his definition of magician was someone that has dedicated their lives to moving the consciousness of mankind forward. And uh, there were levels to his message. Um, one of them was that we must discover our true will and commit every breath, every action, every thought, every deed to the fulfillment, the realization, and then the fulfillment of that true will. And that if we succeed in doing this, there will be no more conflict between people. We can have a harmonious, nearly utopian planet. And another aspect of his message was that we have access to what he called our higher self or holy guardian angel. And I think that the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. The Book of the Law, one of his most famous works, was allegedly channeled in the uh, King's Chamber of the Pyramid in Egypt in, I think, 1904. And in that book, he talks about the new consciousness that's coming and gives a lot of detail about how that would manifest and express and the accuracy of it is absolutely astounding. If you do read the book, I would strongly suggest making sure that you find a copy online that includes the introduction because that's probably as important as the rest of the book. Um, and in the Book of the Law, one of the things that this being that he called Iwas told him was that your proof will be your success. And uh, I think that that has come to pass. In fact, a lot of professional skeptics that have looked at this book that have disregarded Nostradamus, Edgar Casey out of hand have said things like interesting but not conclusive. In other words, it's very difficult to dismiss the prophetical element of this particular book. But that is not the book that we are going to discuss today. As you're probably aware, the idea behind the Gnosis is that there is a truth. The universe came from somewhere. There was a process. This idea rooted probably in political correctness that truth is subjective, that anyone's truth is valid. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that there is really one truth, one process, and I think that it is possible for us all to remember it. And that is basically the fundamental idea behind the Gnosis. And a lot of these expressions in this book of Aleister Crowley's, I had the visions and came to these conclusions many years before I ever encountered them in this book. And I've seen that in many, many places. And this is one of the reasons that I think that the Gnosis is valid. So the book in question is called The Book of Lies, so falsely called, or Breaks, the falsification and wandering of the one thought of Frater Perturabo, which is in itself untrue. Frater Perturabo was Crowley's magical motto or name. It means, he who will endure unto the end. So when I reference Perturabo, that's just a, a, another aspect of of Crowley's personality. I will offer a little bit of bio in case you're totally unfamiliar with Aleister Crowley. He was a Victorian age magician. His definition of magician was a lot different than a lot of other people's. He defined magic as the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. He was raised in a very strict uh, fundamentalist Christian sect called the Plymouth Brethren and that probably influenced him to turn on Christianity uh, as, as vehemently as he did uh, later on in life. He actually acquired his nickname, the Beast, from his mother when he was only four. And for the rest of his life, he would call himself uh, the Master Therion, Therion being uh, Greek for Great Beast. He would sign letters 666, and he's uh, commonly known as the Great Beast 666. Um, he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1888, which was founded by two former 33rd degree Freemasons, which is interesting because it's exactly the same circumstances that gave rise to the OTO, which Coley would be a part of later on. His, probably his first significant work was the Book of the Law. Him and his uh, new fiance dressed up as uh, Persian royalty 
and went to the embassy and bamboozled uh, them into allowing Crowley and his, his new wife to use the king's chambers in the pyramid for their honeymoon. So for three days on April 8th, 9th, and 10th, they allegedly channeled a book called the Book of the Law uh, from a being called Iwas. Crowley never actually determined for sure whether he thought Iwas had its own sub objective existence or if it was just a part of his subconscious mind. It's quite an extraordinary work. I'm sure I'll do a video about that book in particular at some point. And so and Crowley was also a polymath and a quite brilliant polymath. He was a chess master. He would publicly play two other chess masters with his back to them blindfolded, remember their moves, call it his own, and win every single game. He was a record setter on K2 and Everest. He uh, uh, didn't quite summit them, but he got closer to the peak than anyone ever had before him. On one of these journeys, he was snowed in and forced to eat both of his Sherpas. He always kept abreast of all of the latest developments in all of the sciences. He had, you know, massive background in literature and poetry. He was an excellent poet. He was also addicted to cocaine and heroin for a good portion of his life. He was one of the first people to try mescaline. His, one of his main messages being that it was possible to contact our higher self, holy guardian angel, or the higher genius, and gain access to a predator human uh, quantity of knowledge. He seemed to prove with his life because when you read the story and you see how much he traveled and how much he knew and how many books he wrote and just all of this stuff, it really doesn't seem possible for a human being to accomplish all of this. And so I'll do a more detailed biography at some point in the future, but for now, I just wanted to give a little background so that you know who it is that we're talking about. So the book in question is called The Book of Lies. Throughout this book, aside from the chapter that I'm going to specifically recommend that contains the ninth degree secret of the OTO, it is, Nearly every page contains profound revelations of mystical truths and expressions of the Gnosis that are just unparalleled. So here's a little bit of backstory about how this book came into existence. In the late 1800s, I think, two 33rd degree Freemasons broke off from the main body of Masonry and they founded another Masonic, quasi-Masonic fraternity called the OTO, the Ordo Templi. Orientis. One day, Crowley got a knock on his door, and he goes to the door, and there's Theodore Roos and Carl Germer, the two 33rd degree masons that started the OTO. And they said to him, how dare you print our secret? And he said, well, I haven't taken your oath, so I couldn't possibly have printed your secret. So one of these masons goes over to the bookshelf, pulls off the book of lies, and flips it open to chapter 69, the way to succeed and the way to suck eggs. Um, interestingly, I've wondered if this is not the first, you know, is the etymology of the term 69 for oral sex, did it originate with Aleister Crowley in the chapter of this book? I was actually surprised to see that in such an old book. So Crowley said that when he was told this and he reread the chapter, the entire symbolism of Freemasonry and the Western occult mystery tradition flashed upon him, it all unified. And it is true that this secret is in this chapter. And so the response from these two 33rd degree Masons, when they realized that Crowley had not been given the secret in the form of initiation, they made him the head of the outer order of the entire world for the OTO and gave him the name Baphomet, which is of course the androgynous goat-headed deity of the Templars. Interestingly, Crowley claimed to be the reincarnation of the French magician that gave us the popular drawing of Baphomet. It is also interesting that no one disputes that these two guys were legitimate 33rd degree Masons. And the only person that is known to have attempted to violate his oath and expose the secrets of Freemasonry supposedly told no one that he was writing the book, disappeared. When the police went to investigate, this was in I think the mid 1800s in uh, New York, they found the book open on his desk. He'd only written a few paragraphs and the body was found at the bottom of the lake. So the question is, no one seems to dispute that Aleister Crowley revealed the secrets of Freemasonry pretty openly in his books. Why did they allow him to do this? Why wasn't he killed? It's, it's definitely a mystery to me that the Scottish Rite Masons and other contingencies of the establishment 
tolerated Aleister Crowley. If you guys are familiar with Robert Anton Wilson, or if you're not familiar with him, you probably should be. I can recommend Prometheus Rising is an amazing book. This guy was a polymath, genius, um, absolutely an extraordinary mind. Uh, the Illuminatus Trilogy is probably absolutely my favorite book in the world. Um, I will warn you that the first 100 and 120 pages or so, you'll kind of be wondering what in the hell is any of this. It's just scrambled and, and it's very difficult to figure out what the hell is going on. But if you just stick with it, eventually it all kind of ties together. And it is absolutely an astounding work. And it also contains one of the most extraordinary manifestations of paranormal or ESP uh, phenomena that I have ever seen. Towards the end of the book, there is an Illuminati pyramid that's discovered at the bottom of the ocean in a very specific spot. And in 2003, right before Robert Anton Wilson died, a pyramid was discovered in that exact spot. There's actually an interview on YouTube about this manifestation. Also in the book, he uh, references black flag operations like 9-11, where the government would attack its own people in order to create or justify uh, legislation that takes away rights and um, there's just, it's full of extraordinary stuff. It's 1,100 pages long. I've read it many times. Everyone that I've ever recommended it to, I think has read it three times. So Robert Anton Wilson also corroborated that the unifying secret of the Masonic mystery tradition is indeed in that chapter. And studying this book, it is also necessary to have some background in the Jewish mystical tradition because there's a lot of terminology that he uses that if you don't know what these words mean, you won't get much from the chapters. And in my experience, Jewish mysticism does contain some very powerful secrets and some very useful techniques. And it's not gonna take a ton of time. There's only a handful of terms that you need to know. Um, studying the Kabbalistic tree of life and the Sephirot and the different uh, levels of the soul, the Ruash and the Nefesh is a worthwhile pursuit. It will help to unlock some of the secrets in this book. Another clue that I can offer is that one of the secret keys of the book is the idea of nothingness. And so the Gnostic tradition, basically the, the creation cosmology, I guess, is that there was sort of like nothingness. It's not a kind of nothingness that we can conceive of perfectly as human beings. But because this process, once it began, was reflected and is embodied in all of the other parts in its entirety, uh, this is understood, for example, to be where the paradox that we can see imbued in all of existence began. Because the only true unity is nothingness. As soon as you have a thing and space, you have two things. So this paradox, which is another theme in the book, began because of this quality or the expression in this mechanism that gave rise to the universe. And so this nothingness became conscious and this idea created division because now there wasn't just nothing, there was thought and nothing. And of course this thought contained the template that the universe was created from. The uh, one way to say it is that the laws of nature are the mind of God and the matter is the body. And so I'm not gonna go too deeply into that because it's another thing I'll create a video for, but knowing this will help you to decipher the book of lies. So I wanted to share one of my favorite chapters just to give you guys uh, a, a head start on this. It's called The Mountaineer. Consciousness is a symptom of disease. All that moves well moves without will. All skillfulness, all strain, all intention is contrary to ease. Practice a thousand times and it becomes difficult. A thousand thousand and it becomes easy. A thousand thousand times a thousand thousand and it is no longer thou that doeth it, but it that doeth itself through thee. Not until then is that which is done well done. Thus spoke Frater Perturabo as he leapt from rock to rock of the moraine without ever casting his eyes upon the ground. And of course, this is the idea that at our best, we are avatars of this divine consciousness and allowing ourselves to be a hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. Some of you may be familiar with Crowley's most famous quote, which was actually stolen by Harold Gardner, the guy that created Wicca, which by the way is totally fabricated. The reality is that he, shortly before Crowley's death, went and interviewed him and he took Crowley's rituals and a lot of his ideas and he made them simple. I often call Wicca Crowley for dummies. And he made up this backstory about the coven of witches and he modified Crowley's slogan, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, to do as thou wilt and harm me none. Um, a lot of people take this expression of do as thou wilt to mean just do whatever you want, be evil, blah, 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 no. First of all, 
uh, one of the rules that Crowley set forth for this like spirituality of the new eon was that you cannot limit or compromise another person's will because our will is sovereign and equal to the most high God. We are the most high God, pieces of it. We are no lesser. Uh, this idea from the old slave religions basically is being cast aside, that we are equally divine, equally sovereign, and it is our divine right to pursue our will and express that will. And oftentimes when people quote this slogan, they forget that there's a second part, which is love is the law, love under will. So do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, love is the law, love under will. Meaning that all of our actions are also guided and unified by love. Crowley's description of the magician as someone who influences the consciousness of a planet, invisibly, he certainly fulfilled as well. A lot of people are aware that all of the major rock bands were significantly influenced by him. Jimmy Page bought his house, the Boleskine, uh, on the lock. Sting said that he studied his work five hours a day. The Beatles put him on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and on and on and on. His influence in popular culture, which of course in turn influences the generations that consume this popular entertainment, are influenced by the creators of that art. And so, of course, the influence doesn't uh, end with the musicians. There have also been a lot of illustrious people in Hollywood, a lot of authors, even the British Crown placed him on the list of the 100 most important Britons of all time, which was a strange move considering this is a person that considered himself the Antichrist, you know, he was a dark magician, all of this kind of stuff. What, what justification could there be for putting, you know, the Antichrist on a list of the 100 most important Britons of all time? And actually their reasoning, um, the, the official justification that they gave on the list was that he had mapped hitherto unknown portions of the human mind. There's one other Aleister Crowley title that I will mention. Uh, it's a little book called Conk's Own Pox, and it contains a couple of different works, a play and some other stuff. And uh, most of it I didn't really find much value in, but there is a short story that concerns a little girl who has met a fairy prince, and he is taking her through all of the different Sephirot on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And you, that's not stated explicitly, but if you know the Tree of Life and you read the book, you understand that that's what's happening. And somewhere in this story is one of the most deeply guarded, profound, dark secrets of the occult and the Western mystery tradition, and certainly one of the most guarded secrets of Freemasonry. And this isn't thinly veiled, this is explicit. And so if you find it and you send me a private message, I'll let you know, or if you think you found it and you send me a private message, I'll let you know if you are correct or not. I should also recommend uh, the, the preface to the book Magic and Theory and Practice. Crowley lays out his rules or the guiding principles of the magical practice that he was teaching. And his definition of magic is simply causing change to occur in conformity with will. And if you follow the rules that he has outlined in the beginning of this book, you cannot fail at anything that it is possible for you to achieve if you actually employ these guiding principles resolutely. Also the book Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike, 33rd degree Mason, uh, Supreme Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction of the United States in the 1850s. It is truly an extraordinary work and one of the goals not only of Crowley's work but also in Freemasonry is to access these higher planes of consciousness. And when you read Albert Pike, I think it very strongly suggests that these methods work because I don't know that I've ever seen such eloquent, enlightened prose outside of maybe Aleister Crowley. The book was secret until it was leaked and leaked and leaked. Now you can get a copy for usually, you know, in good condition around $50 on Amazon. And all you really have to do is read the first couple of pages and you will understand why masonry is so powerful, how they sort of view populations as energy systems, how they use knowledge of number and geometry to acquire a lot of their power. It's truly an extraordinary work and I would definitely highly recommend that as well. Enlightenment comes in many forms and I think it's a misconception that enlightenment causes a person to become just totally light and loving and totally at peace. I think there are purely evil people that have achieved extraordinary levels of enlightenment. 
And I think that this misconception has contributed to the negative perception of Aleister Crowley. His objective was to experience everything possible, or at least to understand everything possible from every point of view, from the darkest to the most light. So he would write poetry about the most vile, horrendously, I mean, you guys, I can handle a lot, and there is stuff in white stains, I think it is, that is so vile that it turned my stomach, and that is not easy to do, but that was the point. And one of his practices that he recommended to students was to think of what you find repugnant, whether it be a style of music, a food, whatever practice, and engage in that thing until you have learned to like it. Because if you're really trying to become enlightened, you want to understand everything from every possible point of view. This is a practice that's leading towards omniscience. And in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of other Gnostic people, the point of the universe is that the consciousness that we have referred to as God is trying to become self-aware just as we are throughout our lives. It is creating all of these different sentient beings so that it can experience all of the possibilities that are inherent in the universe from as many perspectives as possible. And then once all of this information and possibility is consumed, the universe collapses in on itself, the light basically eats itself, and this causes another big bang and the whole thing starts over again. This is basically a condensed version of, of the, the Gnostic vision that so many of us have had that kind of explains the universe. And microcosm, microcosm, we are doing the same thing that the uh, collective consciousness or the deity or however you want to think of it is, is doing. Also, I think a lot of the ideas that become popular about spirituality are actually restricting people from making progress. Uh, such as the one I mentioned earlier about this sub subjectivity of truth. I sometimes even suspect that these sort of ideas that I believe actually inhibit spiritual growth are promoted and encouraged by those that seek to oppress the evolution of consciousness intentionally. In fact, this idea of knowledge causing the fall, as it is described in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, seems to be almost like a child's fable that describes this process. So I'm sure you guys got some value out of this video. The study of Jewish mysticism and Freemasonry and the entirety of the Corpus Hermeticum are invaluable resources for anyone interested in consciousness. I'll put a couple of links to a couple of extraordinary poems by Aleister Crowley that uh, beautifully elucidate some of the visions of the Gnosis and also can help to increase your metaphysical metabolism by giving you uh, signs, symbols, hints, and clues that you can use in your journey. I'll also put links to a couple of other resources like Hermetic.com where you can find most of the works of Aleister Crowley as well as many other of the great occultists as well as Alice Bailey and Helena Blavatsky and some of these other people that are in the same vein. I hope you guys do check out the Book of the Lies. It is an extraordinary work and I know that it will contribute value. Thank you again for your patronage, and I will uh, be back with another patron-only video, and the next one is going to go deep into one of the darkest secrets of the occult. Also, Psychedelics Masterclass is almost finished, the first installment of it, so make sure you don't miss that. Thanks again, guys.